Good evening, and welcome to our fall session of Beyond the Walls public lecture series. These events are brought to you through a collaboration between Oshawa Public Libraries and the Faculty of Social Science and Humanities at Ontario Tech University. My name is Jennifer Gardner, and I'm with Oshawa Public Libraries. It is my pleasure to open up the evening, and I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. The land we are standing on today is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We acknowledge that Oshawa is covered under the Williams Treaties and as a settler on these lands, we are all treaties people. May we respectfully honor the knowledge and understanding the indigenous stewards of these ancestral lands and ensure that the voices of the first peoples are represented in our collections, programs, and services. Before I turn over the mic to Andrea Braithwaite from the Faculty of Social Science and Humanities, who will introduce our guest speaker, and moderate tonight's program, I would like to ask you to keep your mics muted during the presentation. And if you'd like to ask a question, you can put your hand up through the um, little Zoom thing, or you can put your question in the chat and we would be happy to uh, answer your question in the queue once we open up the uh, discussion uh, floor. So thank you for joining us uh, tonight, we are very excited to host these uh, Beyond the Walls sessions, and we hope that the conversations uh, tonight you enjoy and find them uh, educational and meaningful. Over to you, Andrea. Thank you. Hi, Jennifer. Thank you so much. I am very glad that everybody can be with us this evening. Um, I am very pleased to introduce to everyone one of our faculty's outstanding graduate students, uh, Mr. William Denomi, a PhD candidate in Ontario Tech's forensic psychology program. Mr. Denomi's innovative research looks at how cutting edge neuroimaging technologies and big data algorithms can help us understand drug use, dependency, and withdrawal. So please join me in welcoming him this evening as he fills us in on some of the latest developments in substance use and abuse research, a topic even more pressing during our current healthcare crisis. Oh, all right, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna share my slides. Hopefully that goes well. Okay. Um, so yes, thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is William Denemy. Um, and yeah, I'm a PhD student at Ontario Tech University and I'm very happy to be able to uh, give this talk on uh, addiction literature and addiction research as a whole uh, to a uh, nice open community. Uh, and I'm hoping that this uh, sparks a lot of like uh, conversation and thought into individuals when um, uh, observing just in our day-to-day -day lives substance use issues. Just okay. So substance use disorders in Canada. So uh, when we talk about a substance use disorder, we're talking about a compulsive substance use pattern despite social, personal, or biological consequences and distress. Um, typically diagnosed using uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. Uh, currently, in the fifth edition, it consists of 11 uh, criteria for which you have to meet the threshold for two of them. Um, uh, prior to the DSM-5 and still uh, utilized quite, quite often in uh, empirical research and the DSM-4, uh, we separated substance use disorders based on uh, according to substance abuse and substance dependence. So typically how we will go about diagnosing it is an individual would be evaluated for a substance dependence to alcohol, cannabis, cocaine, methamphetamine, you name it. Um, and if they uh, if they met uh, the threshold to meet for a uh, substance dependence diagnosis, we would leave it at that and measure their severity, age of onset. But if they did not meet the threshold, we would go in and measure a uh, substance abuse disorder, uh, which is typically characterized by criminal justice infractions, uh, persistent uh, pattern of use in, um, in uh, inappropriate settings, 
and uh, the uh, complete and kind of like forgetting to maintain their social, social and financial obligations uh, to maintain their uh, substance use. So in terms of knowing how bad this problem is in Canada, one of the most, the most recent um, estimate of the prevalence of substance use disorders in Canada itself was conducted by Pearson and all from Statistics Canada in 2015. They estimated that over 20% of Canadians, one in five, are going to experience some form of a substance use disorder in their lifetime. Alcohol is the most common substance for which Canadians have met an abuse or dependence diagnosis with nearly 20, um, uh, with nearly 20 percent of their 25,000 respondents having met the criteria for, uh, for an alcohol use disorder. Cannabis was, um, was the second most prevalent form of abuse, uh, substance abuse disorder, uh, which was prevalent in 6.8 percent of respondents. Other drugs such as methamphetamines, cocaine, and opioids were prevalent in 4% of the population. And the most common age group to develop a substance use disorder were youth between the ages of 15 to 24 years of age. More recently, uh, the Canadian Center of Substance, uh, Substance Use and Addiction or Canadian Center of Substance Abuse uh, regularly conducts uh, surveys to assess what the drug use pattern is uh, throughout Canada. So in their 2019 and 2020 surveys, they found that over 75% of alcohol of individuals drank in 2017, 15% um, uh, of respondents drank over uh, low risk drinking guidelines. Cannabis, 14.8% uh, use cannabis, 32% of the individuals who reported using cannabis used it daily. Um, prescription opioids used by 11.8% of the population, 3% for recreational purposes. But hospitalizations for opioid use uh, increased by almost 30% since 2019, which is what we have in a, a, a opioid overdose uh, epidemic or crisis that we currently have going on today, on top of the many other pandemics and crises that we have going on. Um, cocaine was used by 2.5% of the population and methamphetamines by less than 1% of the population. And then to look at the financial toll of the substance use on our uh, Canadian society, uh, uh, a collaboration between the CCSA and the Canadian Institute for Substance Use Research in 2001 found that the total cost of, of SUDs of substance use disorders in 2017 was estimated to be $46 billion per year. Uh, uh, alcohol and tobacco accounts for the majority of this, uh, of this cost. Loss pr productivity based on like sick days at work and so forth uh, account for 44% of the cost, healthcare for 28% and criminal justice for 20%. And now compared to the world, uh, the world has also, uh, the World Health Organization in 2019 published a report that found that since 2016, in 2019, there was an increase in cocaine, opioid and cannabis use of roughly 30% worldwide. Sorry, one, okay. So with substance use so rampant, there's, uh, there's a need to address uh, the, another issue surrounding individuals with a substance use disorder, and that's the stigma that substance users uh, currently experience. So studies have found that substance use disorders are stigmatized to a significantly greater extent than other mental disorders or diseases. For instance, this study by Barry and all in 2014 uh, they found that when judging an individual with a substance use disorder relative to an individual with another mental disorder, say schizophrenia or uh, major depression, an anxiety disorder such as generalized anxiety disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder, or an eating disorder, these participants were unwilling to allow the individual to marry into family to a greater extent than uh, whether they had another mental disorder. They were unwilling to work with uh, on a given job, did not believe Discrimination was a serious problem against these individuals, believe employers should deny employment, believe landlords should deny housing, believe treatment was ineffective, believe recovery was impossible, opposed equivalent insurance benefits for these individuals, and opposed government spending on treatment, housing, or job support. Examples of the stigma included to these here uh, is believing that the individual is res entirely responsible for what uh, uh, for their behavior and their substance use disorder. Uh, there, uh, it could also include social exclusion or distancing, a lack of trust of this in individual, 
or in contrast, an overprotection, use of labels such as a drunk or an addict, these are uh, detrimental labels, uh, denial of housing, hostility in public, and mockery and inappropriate comments. So these individuals uh, are typically subject to stigma, particularly in the sense that a lot of individuals think that they're responsible for their, um, for their substance use disorder. And while the substance use initiation of substance use may be uh, a matter of their responsibility entirely, the disease itself, uh, as we will get to, is less a matter of their choice. But even when it comes to individuals initially using the substance, rather than judging them, we need to also take into account the fact that these are just normal processes that lead to uh, wanting to experiment with these types of substances um, without necessarily wanting the negative outcomes that come along with it. So for instance, a lot of studies find that curiosity and sensation seeking and thrill seeking among youth in particular uh, is one of the main reasons why they start using drugs. So for instance, Parks and All 2004, they found that uh, individuals use club drugs, such as L uh, LSD, MDMA, ketamine, rohypnol, methamphetamines, to experiment with the drug, feel good, and enhance social experience. Another reason was boredom. Uh, so boredom was a primary reason why individuals continued to use the substance after their initial use. They had nothing else to do, they wanted to feel good and have fun, so they used the substance. Another issue is self-medication. As these individuals try and cope with ongoing problems such as depression, anxiety, uh, or chronic, chronic pain, or uh, post-traumatic post um, stress disorder symptoms, they start using a drug in order to alleviate their symptoms, which can then spiral into a more uh, compulsive pattern of substance use. And finally, family and peer influence. Particularly among youth, family member, uh, family member influence and peer pressure can be particularly harmful to individuals trying to abstain from drug use. Um, and in fact, peer influence was found to be a particular reason why individuals continue to use the substance after their initial use, rather than ceasing their use. It helps them fit in, they feel more social, they gain a, a boost of confidence, and so forth. Now the problem with the stigma, on top of the fact that it might be completely unjustified, is the fact that one it inhibits treatment for it, in, it inhibits uh, treatment seeking for these individuals because they don't want to disclose their problem, so they continue to essentially use and harm their uh, biological processes and social processes um, because they don't want to disclose the fact that they have this disorder because they don't want to be stigmatized against. It also reduces treatment efficacy. People don't start to internalize what they're stigmatized about. And as a result, they start uh, having less and less confidence in the treatment that it's gonna have an effect. And therefore they uh, either um, uh, drop out, there's a nutrition rate out of, the out of the treatment program or the principles just don't stick as much. Um, it increases the risk of relapse as well. These individuals, who experience the stigma after they completed treatment, they start to internalize and start feeling shame rather than just guilt. And the shame is manifested in a way that they just think that they're bad people and they don't deserve any better. So in order to feel better, they start to use the substance again. And the stigma is even found in the healthcare system where uh, some individuals will be denied certain treatments that can be um, uh, highly effective for uh, treating substance use disorders. Now, while empathy and personal experience with drug use is pretty good to, uh, in, to reduce stigma, another one is education. And that's why I'm here today, to educate you not only on how rampant drug use is in Canada and the world and how like, scary it can be, but rather how does this disease actually develop? Okay, and uh, I'm going to place emphasis on one aspect in particular, which is drug withdrawal. So drug withdrawal is highly heterogeneous. I'll just open with that. And not everybody experiences the same syndrome. And some individuals uh, don't experience a clinically significant withdrawal uh, syndrome diagnosed using the Diagnostic Statist Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. Uh, in fact, uh, Shuckett and all in 1999-2003, when they were doing some research for the fourth version of the DSM, found that only 50% of substance users would meet the clinical criteria for withdrawal syndrome. For those that do meet this, um, this uh, criteria, 
Withdrawal typically occurs between six and 48 hours after the last dose. Drink, hit, uh, and this dose is gonna be either a drink, a hit, an injection, a bump, or a snort, any type of terminology you wanna use for using a given uh, drug. And the symptoms are uh, widely diverse and highly, and highly specific as well to the uh, given substance that you're using. And how we can think about withdrawal uh, kind of like an, in an abstract form is it's going to, withdrawal is going to be the opposite of whatever the effect of the drug is. So this can include tachycardia, such as a racing heart, high blood pressure, sweating, fever chills, hand tremors, psychomotor agitation or, or restlessness. For instance, uh, benzodiazepine withdrawal was in the news recently because it caused something called akathisia, which can only be described as an incessant and almost painful need to move uh, your body uh, without any, any inability to stop. You can also have nausea, headache, or vomiting and diarrhea, lack of energy, anxiety, hallucinations, delusions, paranoia, irritability, bone and muscle pain, depression, negative mood, anhedonia, changes in sleep, changes in appetite, seizures, grand mal seizure, particular with um, alcohol, uh, with uh, alcohol withdrawal, and delirium tremens, which can be characterized by uh, increases in confusion, hyperthermia, and uh, lack of motor control. So for instance, uh, one example of how uh, withdrawal itself can be particularly detrimental is when looking at uh, alcohol withdrawal and neurotoxicity in the brain. So withdrawal with certain from certain drugs, particularly alcohol, could lead to hospitalizations and, de and death. Alcohol withdrawal syndrome can result in seizures, delirium tremens, ICU admissions, and without proper care, death in 1% to 4% of patients who are abstaining from long-term uh, high-risk alcohol use. The reason being is that alcohol will inhibit the neurotransmitter in the brain that essentially causes activation in the brain, which we call glutamate. Uh, and that's the reason that you have uh, either you're uh, more tired after you drink or after you've had too many drinks, you can no longer form memories because there's no more glutamate firing in the brain to create those memories. So you end up having a blackout, something that some of us are a little too familiar with me. Um, However, uh, the issue is that with chronic alcohol use, the brain starts fighting back against the substance that's being entered into it. So it starts to increase the amount of glutamate receptors in the brain, allowing for more glutamate transmission. And this transmission is no more uh, abundant than when they're undergoing alcohol withdrawal. So you might be thinking, okay, so they're going through withdrawal, they're experiencing more brain activity. So that should actually like kind of help them, right? Like they, they should be able to like think more. And Nature isn't that simple. Rather, when they experience alcohol withdrawal, they have so much glutamate in the brain that it starts to kill off cells. Glutamate can also act as a communication tool in the brain to kill off neurons that are no longer um, active enough, that are sick, or that simply have to be pruned away. But with alcohol withdrawal, this uh, is substantially way above what we could call healthy levels of glutamate. This could lead to... Uh, 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 grand mal seizures in the brain, uh, neuronal uh, cell death, activation of proteins causing the uh, immune system itself to attack uh, brain cells and substantial brain damage. And so, uh, but what I want to focus on is the long-term changes that could occur as a function of withdrawal, uh, withdrawal from drugs. So this man here, his name is George Coob, and he was director of the National Institute for Alcohol Abuse, um, Alcohol Abuse in the United States for like the longest time. And him and his colleagues developed the uh, stress surfite reward efficiency model of addiction to kind of explain how addiction develops and how it's maintained. So pretty simply put, you use a substance and then you start using it repeatedly in a really impulsive way, and then it starts be to become compulsive. The change from impulsivity to compulsivity is, uh, is uh, thought to be psychologically due to a change in positive to negative reinforcement, substantiating these individual substance use patterns. What we start to see though, is that as the individual cycles through three stages, which is binge, you use the drug, uh, abstinence, you stop using the drug, and craving, you really want the drug. As individuals cycle through the three stages, we start seeing two things. One, the amount of drug that they need to essentially feel high increases. 
the amount of what uh, the severity of their uh, withdrawal starts to increase in abstinence, resulting in abstinence no longer being the second stage, but rather it is withdrawal or negative affect. And the um, salience or invalence of non-drug rewards, such as food, something appropriate to want to search for a reward for, is now decreased as well. And Robertson and Barrage in 1993 and again in 2000 best characterizes as these individuals start to want the drug, even though they no longer like it. So they start to have a compulsive need to have the drug, even though they actually don't like taking it. And it's actually taking quite of a toll on them, but they can't find their, their uh, an ability. They don't have an ability to stop. So in the brain, there, uh, there are a couple of systems that, uh, that are involved in the development of this chronic substance use pattern. So when we talk about drug reward, when the individual takes a drug and feels high about it, typically see an activation of the dopaminergic system and the opioidergic system, particularly the mu and delta systems. Uh, we see activation in the nucleus accumbens, the central nucleus of the amygdala, the ventral tegmental area, and the ventral pallidum, which comprise what we call the basal, uh, basal ganglia, or the, uh, in animals, it's the ventral striatum. In withdrawal, in withdrawal, we see kind of an opposite pattern of activity. Now, we do still see central nucleus of amygdala activity in withdrawal, but it's serving a different purpose. Rather than signaling for reward, we're now signaling for stress. The regions that are activated in withdrawal uh, correspond to the corticotropic system, such a, uh, which uh, leads to an increase in stress hormone in the brain, the opioidergic system, but not the same, not the same one, the dynorphin and kappa system, which results in pain signaling. So these individuals are now experiencing pain rather than pleasure. And the bed nucleus of stria terminalis also activates. Now this region, on top of having a way too long name, like super too long, it doesn't need to be that long, what it does do is activate in times of anxiety or free flowing stress to get you kind of ready for your initial, for your stress response. And this region is highly involved in the withdrawal uh, response to uh, uh, ceasing drug use. What ends up happening after is that we start seeing an increase in craving preoccupation after withdrawal, which is caused by glutamatergic system activation, dopaminergic system activation in response to drug cues, making you highly sensitive to wanting to use drugs in, in the face of stuff that might remind you of it. Increase in nucleus accumbens, cardiopatamin, basolateral amygdala, and hippocampus activity, uh, essentially recruiting memories of how great it was to use the drug, how bad it was when you stopped using the drug, and making you want to use the drug more. So your brain is essentially kind of losing control over what it's going after in order to feel bored. We want to feel a hedonic, um, an, a hedonic like reward uh, in our lives. And the brain, rather than guiding you towards food or stuff that you need in order to stay alive, is going to guide you toward drugs. This is best uh, characterized by um, another model developed by Rita Goldstein and Nora Volkow. Um, Rita Goldstein is a professor at Mount Sinai University and Nora Volkow is director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Um, she's also worked, uh, both of them have worked quite a bit with George Coop as well. Um, and really we can best characterize this using what we call a Q reactivity paradigm. So in this paradigm, individuals with substance disorder and controls are placed in say an MRI, an EEG, or anything that we could observe their behavior, uh, behavior or activity or so forth. And they, we show them pictures or videos of individuals using drugs or individuals uh, getting reward from something else such as sex, money, or food. Uh, our laboratory itself uses food. Rita Goldstein and Nora Volkow, they theorize that one of the central reasons that individuals keep using drugs after they experience withdrawal is because they are uh, one, impulsive, and two, that they are going to, um, that they are biologically and cognitively uh, tailored to only seek out the drugs rather than food. So they're automatically going to go towards drugs as a, as a source of reward relative to food. And they're going to be, um, they're going to lack the disinhibition, the inhibition necessary to kind of like take a step back and think about what they're doing before acting for a drug. Um, as a result, what we end up seeing with substance users, and they're extremely sensitive to cues that might lead them to want to use the drugs. So they're, when they pass a bar, 
they pat and that uh, reminds them of their alcohol use and they have a hard time ignoring that the craving that results from that and focusing on a restaurant that's across the street that could lead them to want to eat instead of drink. It doesn't really help that all restaurants kind of serve alcohol, but uh, se separate um, issue. So another example, for an example of this drug cue paradigm, what we, uh, and what we actually observe. Our laboratory, um, in particular, Denemy, Simard, and Shane, uh, I've circled all our heads. Um, we're laughing because I think my supervisor said something funny, and we have Femi down here as well. Um, uh, so we, uh, we conducted a study comparing those who are dependent on cocaine and those that weren't dependent on cocaine based on their activity towards drugs and food-related videos. So this is essentially what they would see. These individuals would sit in an MRI, they would just lie down in an MRI, and they would see a video of somebody preparing or using crack cocaine or someone eating food. So this person's eating a sandwich, someone was eating eggs, um, this person is smoking a crack pipe. And what we end up seeing in the brain is that indiv individuals with a cocaine dependence, uh, uh, which are represented by the black bars, show an increase in drug or food reactivity relative to non-dependent participants. Non-dependent participants are gonna show increased activity to food. The particular difference is really their activity to the food in the circumstance. So uh, individuals with a cocaine depends will show less activity overall, but in particular, their brains turn off when they see a food related reward. Um, because the reward, is, the food related reward is no longer salient to them. They only focus on the drug related rewards. So how does withdrawal play a role in this? So uh, studies have looked at how withdrawal could lead to these Q reactivity biases and these biased uh, salience processing of drugs and non-drug rewards. So for instance, a literature review by Jasinska in 2014 found that individuals who are acutely abstinent from uh, 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 drugs, so uh, the majority of studies utilize smokers, so 12 to 14 hours after their last cigarette, uh, they exhibited greater drug cue reactivity uh, to non-drug reactivity relative to controls ones, uh, or substance users that were not abstinent or both. These effects are typically observed in regions that we highlighted in our own study, such as the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, the striatum, and the anterior cingulate. Now, the problem with these studies is that abstinence may not necessarily coincide with withdrawal. Um, like I mentioned before, about 50% of individuals who experience, uh, who uh, abstain from drug use experience a clinically significant withdrawal. So how are these uh, withdrawn participants targeted? One way is to look at detoxification or withdrawal management clinics. So alcohol dependent patients admitted to a withdrawal management program, uh, they typically exhibit greater drug or uh, non-drug reactivity in the brain. And this can be, uh, this can be uh, um, reversed if we administer a pharmaceutical agent after the withdrawal has already passed, uh, uh, which uh, once we do, we can end up uh, either seeing no difference in the processing of drug and non-drug rewards or an absolute reversal where they start processing food appropriately again. But when withdrawal is not managed, we start, having, we start seeing these long-term changes. So Lee and all in 2013 had this groundbreaking study that was extremely interesting. What they ended up doing, they gave rats cocaine two hours a day for five days. They ended up finding that synapses started developing, these small connections started developing between the amygdala and the nucleus accumbens, that were those regions that are involved in stress and reward. Together, they lead to more craving. But these synapses were largely inactive. They weren't doing anything. They, they just like developed and they were just like, they just exerted enough activity so that they wouldn't die off. But after 45 days of withdrawal in these rats, uh, not only did these rats start to want the drug even more, but those synaps synapses, those connections started getting extremely active. And when you block the activation in those synapses, these individual, these rats would not want cocaine anymore. They wouldn't seek it anymore. Typically, we observe it by having them poke something with their nose for a drug reward or a non-drug reward. It's uh, cute and barbaric at the same time. Uh, science. <laughs> um, so and similar results were observed on synapses between the nucleus accumbens and the prefrontal cortex. In humans, uh, what uh, our laboratory has found with Denimine Shane uh, 2020, 
So we separated our cocaine dependent participants based on whether or not they experience a clinically significant uh, withdrawal syndrome. What we ended up seeing is that only those who have experienced a clinically significant withdrawal syndrome exhibit greater activity towards drugs relative to food, whereas the ones who did not experience a clinically significant withdrawal syndrome showed a similar pattern of activation to individuals uh, that were non-dependent, our control group. So that just goes to show the importance of withdrawal uh, in the development of these salience biases. What ends up happening for, based on what we've observed is that once withdrawal hits, there, the salience, the importance and the activity related to non-drug rewards is significantly dampened. And as a result, uh, these individuals are much more likely to um, uh, show acti activation towards drug-related rewards. And the implications of that is that they would be more likely to uh, utilize a substance should a cue make itself apparent. So to summarize, uh, the a reason individuals use substance, uh, use drugs, they use drugs in, in essentially to feel, uh, feel high and to engage social um, in, uh, help social situations improve, and then they end, in, end up uh, entering a pattern where they can't stop, mainly because uh, these individuals develop a very strong withdrawal syndrome that causes profound changes in their brain, resulting in them wanting drugs uncontrollably. So there are ways to manage withdrawal. So one is through withdrawal management centers. So uh, in these uh, centers, counselors and health pr practitioners carefully monitor individuals while they're undergoing uh, withdrawal, full-blown withdrawal. This could be withdrawal from any given drug, alcohol, uh, heroin, cocaine, and so forth. You, they give you uh, essentially a bed and you're monitored while you experience the withdrawal syndrome. These counselors also provide psychosocial support during the height of the withdrawal syndrome to help you cope with the symptoms. Um, and successfully overcome them without wanting to use the drug again. And then this could be followed up by in-house counseling programs with various uh, and various substance users anonymous sessions, such as Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. And uh, an added bonus is that you could be relayed to long-term long -term treatment, um, uh, treatment options, such as cognitive behavioral therapy or motivational therapy. Now, uh, there are a number of advantages to this. Uh, so one, you can safely abstain from the drug, so we have less risk of these individuals uh, uh, experiencing serious harm as a result of their, uh, uh, their withdrawal syndrome. You can be connected with long-term treatment options. It also, it also offers community and home-based withdrawal management resources. Uh, increasingly today, amid the COVID-19 pandemic, we have uh, tele, uh, telehealth health and telemedicine-based um, use of um, uh, withdrawal management. And it's useful in identifying and managing psychotic symptoms, uh, pr particularly prominent during stimulant cocaine and methamphetamine withdrawal, uh, which is better because uh, if not, those uh, symptoms are gonna be showing up in the community itself. But there are disadvantages to this withdrawal of management. It's not, a, it's not a perfect fix. One, there's a very limited amount of beds in a given clinic. For instance, the Oshawa Residential Withdrawal Center only has 22 beds. Considering we have an opioid use crisis, I'm going to go ahead and guess that we have more than 22 uh, opioid users just in Oshawa. Um, and in Canada, that's probably even higher. Um, uh, there's a very low admission in aftercare as well. So even though we do relay the information to them so they can get better, uh, um, there's a very low uh, uptake of these long-term resources. The long-term uh, effects of withdrawal are not addressed. So all this Q reactivity uh, problems that happen as a result of withdrawal itself aren't addressed in the withdrawal management center is really for acute withdrawal effects. There's a high rate of relapse following discharge and it can also take a toll on healthcare systems, particularly with those having repeated emissions coming back for uh, withdrawal management. So there are long-term treatment, uh, treatment uh, options that can both help with the effects of withdrawal and uh, ensure that these individuals don't experience a withdrawal syndrome at all which isn't really, isn't really a bad deal. It would be great if we can offer a treatment program where they don't have to experience pain or distress uh, from not using this highly rewarding substance. So it falls into three categories. The first is what we call antagonist treatment. An antagonist treatment is a drug that's going to block the effects of a given neurotransmitter or a given uh, protein in the brain. 
So uh, some examples are naltrexone, acamprozat, gabapentin, and antipsychotics and antidepressants. So they block the rewarding effects of the drugs and drug cues, which can lead to individuals wanting and craving the drug less when they're exposed to these drug cues. The problem is, is that they have very poor adherence, particularly with opioid use disorder, and they're typically less effective in long-term treatment outcomes uh, relative to partial agonist or agonist treatments. The next category is, ag is partial agonist treatment. So this will offer, this will increase the activity of say one neurotransmitter while blocking the activity of another. So for instance, we'll have buprenorphine. It'll increase the activity of dopamine while blocking the activity of opioids. We also have ver uh, verinicline, uh, bupropion, and methylphenidate. So these are useful uh, for reducing craving with a very high safety profile. Uh, very low risk of individuals experiencing withdrawal at all um, and uh, reducing craving. And bupropion is one of the few drugs that can be used to treat methamphetamine use disorder. Although these studies are still in pilot testing phases, it's just showing very promising results. Um, Varinicline and cystan are particularly useful in the treatment of nicotine addiction. And these can, uh, these partial agonists are longer lasting uh, than drugs of review, which, which allows us to have fewer doses. We don't need as many doses to help these individuals. An agonist, agonist treatment uh, provide a full, um, uh, full uh, rewarding effects of, the, of uh, the drug by essentially increasing neurotransmitter that's targeted by the drug. These include methadone and dextroamphetamine. Dextroamphetamine being one of the few drugs that can be used to treat long-term amphetamines uh, use disorder. But there's still barriers to these pharmaceutical treatments, such as lack of structural, uh, structural facilitators to obtain medication and non-adherence to this medication. Um, focusing on these uh, agonist treatment, they're highly controversial, but highly effective as well. So they allows, it allows individuals to experience the rewarding effects of a substance while also putting off withdrawal in a safe and monitored manner. They also, uh, 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 they last longer than uh, these drugs of abuse, allowing for fewer doses and less of a risk of overdose. Evidence suggests that for treating opioid use disorder in particular, this yields the highest efficacy when compared to antagonist treatments and agonist treatments. Some evidence suggests they can also have higher retention in treatment programs relative to partial agonist, um, partial agonist um, uh, drugs. Uh, however, a meta-analysis of random control trials um, and observational studies uh, with studies that occurred prior to the year of 2018 did not find a significant benefit of methadone relative to buprenorphine. So uh, there's more investigation that must be conducted on these agonist therapies in terms of retention of, um, of patients. But there are still challenges. So one, there's a limited understanding in the community on the benefit of harm, of harm reduction uh, therapies which uh, relates to essentially the stigma that we have um, in society. In fact, stigma against people who use the drugs and the agencies that support them lead to a very low uptake and retention. Uh, there's also poor data reporting on the effects of these methadone uh, treatments. So we need a much more open science uh, framework in order to evaluate the effects of these agonist treatments. And there's still a very prosecutorial mindset among the general community and health practitioners about uh, substance users and the use of such strategies. So one, uh, another form of uh, uh, agonist therapy is a safe injection site. So the safe injection site al uh, allows individuals to use um, sterilized needles in a supervised, uh, supervised environment in it to uh, inject say heroin or another, or morphine or another drug of abuse. Um, they ensures that the needles are safe, not shared, and reduces the risk of contracting a given virus such as um, uh, HIV, humano, uh, human immunodeficiency virus, and reduces the risk of an, uh, of an overdose. The clientele are also directed towards support groups and rehabilitation facilities and other treatment options. Uh, and it does result in decreased hospital stays, overdoses, transmission of diseases, public, public injection of drugs, and an increase in those seeking treatment but there's still some disadvantages, notably that we uh, currently don't know the entire effects of the safe injection site in terms of a sociological standpoint, uh, and it requires further investigation. And finally, some non-pharmaceutical treatment options are cognitive behavioral therapy, where we target these individuals' bias, craving, 
uh, for drug related rewards relative to food rewards that they develop at withdrawal and we try and reverse it. This can include having them cope with their withdrawal symptoms and really target their emotions that they feel at a given moment they see a drug and reversing it, having full control over it. It's useful in reducing craving and attentional biases to the drug and resulting drug use. Another uh, good treatment is uh, mindfulness and meditation, which teaches individuals to remain present and monitor their given emotions uh, in a non-judgmental, accepting manner um, in order to really target them and modify their behavior with cognitive behavioral practices as well. The pairing of pharmaceutical agents to manage withdrawal and cognitive behavioral mindfulness techniques could lead to individuals being not essentially distracted by the distress they experience with withdrawal, and facilitate these individuals to really focus in and take stock of their emotions and uh, alter them in order to have long-term treatment effects. Blocking withdrawal from the get-go could also block the odds that they develop these neurocognitive abnormalities resulting in uh, easier, easier treatment uh, remission. But currently the evidence for the efficacy of pairing treatments is limited. So in particular, this pharmaceutical agents show very strong efficacy with treating substance use disorder, but we still have inconclusive data on the use of um, uh, on the use of psychosocial interventions as well. Uh, in, in particular, whether the psych psychosocial intervention has an incremental value to the pharmaceutical agent treating the uh, addiction disorder. So before I leave, here is a list of uh, some information resources for individuals that wish to discuss to anybody about a substance use problem uh, with themselves or with a member of their family or friends. Uh, the Government of Canada has resources, the Canadian Mental Health Association, Wellness Together, Canadian Centre for Substance Abuse, Addiction and Mental Health uh, and Problem Gambling Services at Connects Ontario. Um, and also in Oshawa alone, there's a Methadone Oshawa Clinic. Um, a Pinewood Addiction Center as well, the Durham Region Municipal Government, and the Carrier Community Health Center. So a big thank you to uh, my supervisor for his uh, guidance and um, throughout, my, throughout my education. My fiance who is an unequivocal source of psychosocial support while I do everything in life. Uh, the Oshawa Public Library for holding this event. Uh, researchers at the CCSA, NIH, NIDA, and, and uh, NIAAA. Funding from NIDA and SHRC, individuals appearing in our uh, QB activity videos, the participants that uh, show up for our uh, studies, the research assistant at the Mind Research Network, uh, and social workers, mental health workers, and physical health practitioners who are working uh, throughout these uh, substance use uh, with individuals with substance use disorders. Thank you. Um, and I have a big list of references, um, and I can also share these slides with anybody who wishes to um, see them. So, thank you. That was fantastic. So fascinating. Um, and I also appreciated the screen full of dog pictures, which is always a great way to end things. Um, I, we've already got a couple of questions in the chat, so I'd like to head there first. We've got one from Stephen Verk, who is asking, are the physiological changes to the brain causing the addiction permanent? I wouldn't say necessarily permanent, because what we start seeing uh, typically in life um, is addiction rates essentially are negatively correlated with age. So as individuals get older, they start reporting fewer signs of a substance use disorder. So I think they cause long-term changes um, and they can lead to a long-term risk of relapse in uh, these individuals. The actual extent of this long-term effect though, I don't know it. Uh, I don't know it off the top of my head. I'm not sure that the literature has, um, has a study that really points that. It would require quite a comprehensive long, uh, longitudinal study, um, which, I suppose with funding I can do. So I'm taking donations. Oh, always funding, right? Um, it's all funding. It's always all funding. Um, our next question comes from Jennifer Gardner. Do you have any thoughts on why psychosocial modalities for treatment is not well supported slash researched for helping people recover from substance abuse disorders? Um, so it, I don't think it's that they're not effective, is that they're not having much of an incremental value to a pharmaceutical agent. So I think a lot of the issue with substance use disorders is that they're feeling 
uh, we really have to block their uh, the distress that occurs when they're not using a substance and the craving. And I think if you like um, neurobiologically block that, then the cognitive need, then the, that kind of reduces the cognitive load. There's, it could also be a matter of once individuals uh, experience these drugs, they no longer feel they have to put in the same amount of effort in their psychosocial treatments, reducing the efficacy of the psychosocial treatment itself. Um, you get out of it what you put into it. So if um, individuals start feeling better without uh, just on their own, they might not adhere to their treatment as much. It's similar to what we see with individuals with anxiety disorders, and mood disorders, is once they start feeling better because we're giving them antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications, they stop uh, attending their, um, they stop attending their uh, 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 treatment programs. Okay. I'm not seeing any hands, so I'm going to leap in and ask one that I was curious about. You talked earlier about the role that stigma can play in sort of stopping people maybe from getting the help they need when they need it. And I am curious about how this might change depending on the different like the variations in the stigma we have. Cause I was thinking about like the whole sort of wine mom culture that's currently sort of circulating, right? And it's like mommy juice and this sort of thing that tends to paint this kind of use and dependency as, as, as fun and as normal and as kind of going hand in hand with particular life choices. And so I'm wondering how, how those kinds of sort of cultures or discourses fit in when we're thinking about how stigmas form. Yeah, so I think the stigma is, um, like, I think it's really about, like, what you associate with it. With So with the wine mom, you know, there one, there's the wine, and then there's a the mom, which we kind of learn to, you know, trust and that they have control and everything. Whereas if we talk about the addict, um, the addict is the individual who is shirking on his uh, responsibilities and so forth. So, um, yeah, that's that's actually a really good question. Um, I'm thinking right now that it's kind of like uh, it'll transition from one way or another. Essentially, like the wine mom ideology could uh, facilitate problematic use because it can go unchecked for so long. And then the individuals will suddenly change their language completely being like, OK, well, now she's not a wine mom. She's a drunk. Um, and that's kind of the that's kind of the scary part is when you have this sudden change in um, how we appraise an individual's behavior from fun to problematic. And when this problematic, um, what this problematic uh, change would essentially do is the individual knows that it's coming, so they won't want to disclose their problem. They're keep, going to keep using the wine mom um, argument in order to substantiate their substance use um, and, and not address it. So yeah, I think it's a matter of like not wanting to disclose because you're going to, once you disclose, you know your terminology is definitely going to change and people are going to look at you different. Other questions? Sure, I'll ask one. Um, so I'm just wondering about your thoughts uh, in terms of the pandemic and the, the increase of substance abuse, um, substance users, substance abuse disorders. Um, has there, is there any upcoming research or anything that can tie increased consumption of alcohol and drugs um, to the pandemic and social isolation? Is there anything that you've seen in, in as far as coming down the research pipes? Yeah, so the Canadian Center of Substance, um, Substance Use and Addiction have actually put out a report on the effects of the COVID-19 um, on substance use. And they really highlight the stress induced by COVID-19 in terms of the substance use pattern. So what they ended up seeing was a substantial use of alcohol, nicotine, cannabis in order to cope with the ongoing situation. Um, either the boredom or the stress of being stuck at home. Uh, so individuals use drugs in order to, you know, have some type of fun um, or uh, in order to stress with the ongoing situation of like, you don't know, it look, feels like the world's coming to an end. Um, everything has like changed. So you uh, use drugs in order to feel some type of uh, 
some type of uh, essentially positive throughout this experience. Uh, so that's what the CCSA essentially found is that they have um, they, they've observed uh, the use of alcohol and nicotine and cannabis as a coping method uh, to have increased. And that can be considered a maladaptive coping method because it can easily spiral down to these use disorders where these individuals can't stop. Uh, we've got a follow-up to that in the chat from Peter. Uh, just to jump on the last question, is there concrete evidence that certain socioeconomic conditions slash changes make recovery more challenging? Um, so I can't think of a reference right now, like off the top of my head. Um, as I was preparing this talk, I did find a couple of resources, uh, a couple of papers that did identify social socioeconomic status was a significant moderator of like treatment efficacy or treatment retention, um, and in particular, the treatment uh, for pharmaceutical agents. So during my talk, I talked about barriers to receiving pharmaceutical treatments, and a lot of them were uh, structural, actually. So individuals from lower socioeconomic uh, conditions or from marginalized groups are less, are less likely, systemically and structurally, to be able to access the means of obtaining these pharmaceutical agents, either uh, in the United States in particular with health insurance, so that they can't necessarily afford the pharmaceutical um, that were, uh, the funds to acquire these pharmaceutical agents. And in Canada, they might not have uh, the associate employment or um, uh, employment insurance that can help them pay for these pharmaceutical agents. Um, these agents, these pharmaceutical treatments can cost, uh, can be very expensive. Um, so it's important that uh, these individuals have a way to kind of like leverage um, the kind of take some of the uh, uh, cost off of themselves. There also needs to be a way for them to get to these, um, to get to the centers to obtain the treatment centers, to, to obtain the necessary treatment, which uh, if you have a, somebody from a given area that say public transportation does not go to as much, or um, that uh, it's harder to get to because of its like general geographic location, they might be less able to attend their treatment programs and therefore it leads to less adherence and uh, perhaps drop out and relapse. Um, I'm going to jump on Peter's jump on question. And, and I wanted to pick up on a few of the elements you mentioned here, um, the kind of geographical things and, and as I know many of us attending this evening um, are familiar with, this is one of those issues that Oshawa is currently dealing with. And so I'm wondering what, what kinds of factors are overlapping to make Oshawa one of the geographical locations that, that finds itself grappling with this issue more than other geographical locations? Um, so based on that, I. Um, I don't have much empirical evidence. So this is kind of like based on, um, based on my own experience living in the Oshawa area. Um, I also know that uh, it, it's not, it's not just, it's a lot of these like kind of like small cities. Uh, so they're not really a town and they're not really a big city like Toronto, but they're kind of small. So Guelph is experiencing a similar problem. Um, London is experiencing a similar problem as Oshawa. Um, it just so happens that Oshawa is the most populated one in the Durham region. So Durham, uh, so Durham's issue is highly centralized to Oshawa's location. I think what happens is these are areas that um, have... Uh, either a lot of history, uh, a lot of history and uh, lack of um, means to essentially get these individuals to work. Uh, so with these smaller cities, there's less offices and less factories like created in order for them to uh, find work and all that. So, and, um, and not everybody can make it all the way to um, all the way to Toronto to attend work every day. So because of that, they end up having trouble finding a job in the very competitive environment of Oshawa just because of a lack of availabilities. Um, there's also the fact Oshawa in particular um, has a lot of has a lot of pain because of what happened with the GM plant um, and no, individuals who were um, laid off, they weren't necessarily trained to take on another position, they ended up feeling a lot of stress and they ended up coping in one of the ways that was most available to them, which was uh, drug use. 
and that kind of as we talk about family influence and peer influence that kind of just like snow and snowballs into uh newer generations and leads to these um leads to the problems that we're seeing today um so because of that i think that's what happens with these small towns is there's not enough uh, uh resources for everyone and so individuals cope the way that they can and they uh, pass along those coping mechanisms to future generations, resulting in these small communities having um, having these uh, issues. I think we've got time for the one last question that we've got in the chat from K.O. I was talking to a client who mentioned that his whole family was substance users. We got on the topic of nature versus nurture. Is there any research that there are neurological factors, epigenetics that make people more likely to engage in substance use? Yes, there's <clears throat> There's a huge amount of research uh, finding both epigenetic and um, uh, uh, epigenetic and just basic uh, basic genetic um, vulnerabilities towards substance use. The uh, best one I can think of is the um, it's a um, enzyme that breaks down dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, they found that individuals with um, with a particular polymorphism on this gene result in them having essentially too much of it. Um, so this gene overacts essentially and starts to eat away at uh, dopamine too much, resulting in them wanting to use drugs more often uh, than individuals without it. So uh, this is particular with cannabis use disorder because, and it made headlines because it resulted in, um, um, there were a lot of uh, individuals with the cannabis use disorder that developed schizophrenia and they ended up having a coincidence of these, this uh, Compt enzyme uh, polymorphism. Um, so yeah, there are lots of uh, epigenetics, and you can like imagine that when individuals inject uh, these kind of foreign substances into their into their brains, and these are interacting with their cells, they can interact with the actual nucleus of the cell itself. It could lead to alterations in the given um, m mRNA um, mRNA expression, transcription, and translation um, that could be transmitted into future generations, particularly when we start uh, talking about individuals who use a substance while they're pregnant. Um, uh, then we start seeing uh, profound uh, uh, cellular activations, deactivations and gene, uh, gene um, uh, silencing or unsilencing that could lead to profound problems. Thank you. I think we made it through all of the questions with like a minute and a half to spare. Um, so, I wanted to thank you again for this comprehensive and thoughtful sort of layout of, of the issues and the options and the obstacles and the opportunities. This was really fantastic. If everybody would join me in a, a round of virtual applause for our guest this evening. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you so much. And you can find information about our next installment in weeks in the chat. And thank you all for joining us this evening. It was wonderful to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me, everyone. Good night. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>